from DFW with your host, Robbie and Tracy Mitchell. Yeah, we're excited, Jacob. We're ready, but I need some insider tips. What's what's? How do we win this game? Okay, all right. It's really simple. See, paintball. It's really a game about just not being scared. A lot of times, groups will come in, won't even move at all. Yeah. If you actually just, you know, embrace the fact that you might get shot at a little bit, that's fine. Move on up. Get a, like a better bunkers, better placement on the field and it makes some magic happen. So be offensive. Be offensive. Not defensive. Not defensive. Because you got an instinct to stop mm -hmm. and not move. But I don't want to get hit. I don't want to, I don't want to, I don't want to feel pain. <laughs> How do I avoid that? Well, well, you put on the whole armor, that's what you do right here. How about that? All right, turn off the safety's off. On. Off. Game starts in five, four, three.
notice you left your gloves off. Um, he gave me gloves, but I forgot them, and so now I have bruises. Huh. Isn't that something you wasn't covered? I wasn't covered. You should have made sure I was covered. As your husband. Yeah. Uh -huh. Oh, great. Yeah. Put it on me. Uh-oh. There's the gloves. There's my gloves right there. <laughs> Thank you. Invisible glove person. Yes. Wow. <laughs> Anything else we should know? I would also... Uh, paintball a lot of times is a game of angles. Okay. Angles. Angles. It's okay. really about uh, kind of taking the proper approach. A lot of times players will shoot over the tops of bunkers when you really should be coming around the sides. Oh yeah. Really approaching from a different yeah. angle, a different right. opportunity. Because a lot of times that first opportunity doesn't always come. So should I come from the back or from the from the, the corners? Last time I came from the back and it didn't work. You want to come from the corners. Okay. And you want to so change sides? You want to change sides. Yeah. Yeah. So they won't think you're going to pop out on the same side. Absolutely, sir. Wow. Yeah. That's uh, normally my recommendation. But beyond that, just have fun with it. Does it hurt when you get shot? No. No, it doesn't. Totally does. <laughs> he said that earlier and I got nicked and it hurt. So if you put on the whole armor of God, this is the helmet of salvation and the breastplate of righteousness and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Clint Eastwood 45. Right? Is that your Clint Eastwood 45? Uh -huh. Wow. And your loins girt about with truth. Okay. And that's what we were doing. Yeah. Oh, man, it's been fun. Awesome. It's been excellent. Excellent. Oh, thank you for having us. Of course. I appreciate it. In our culture, anxiety has not only paralyzed how we think and feel, it has stifled our imagination and suppressed our ability to think big. In part one of Becoming Brave, you will immediately experience a mind shift. You will learn how to stop living out of your memory and actually start living out of your imagination. You will grow by taking an inventory of your life, asking the difficult questions, stretching your imagination, surrounding yourself with people who challenge you, and most importantly, possessing an unshakable faith that God delights in your success. Part two is all about dreaming wildly. A sign of spiritual maturity is our willingness to follow God's plan when we feel incompetent or overwhelmed for the journey ahead. For many, the dread of failure keeps us stuck in mundane living and we often settle for small, safe dreams rather than stepping out of the boat and believing for big, extravagant dreams. In this section of Becoming Brave, we will explore the goodness of God, learn that He is the source of vision and provision, and for those who've gotten stuck, are sidetracked by negative life's occurrences, or simply who've made poor choices, you'll have the opportunity to dream wildly to regain your breath and to step into your destiny. Finally, in part three, we will master how to live fear-free. Living an enjoyable and fulfilling life begins with the determination to live life from the posture of faith rather than fear. I've discovered the percentage of people who actually think big and dream wildly is overwhelmingly small. Why? Because of fear. We focus on what we assume that we can accomplish in our own strength, rather than identifying what we can accomplish through God's strength. As you read through this section, you will be empowered on how to regain your personal initiative, which will equip you to bounce back when you feel like life has just simply kicked you to the curb. You will learn that by modeling courage, you will actually diffuse fear and discover that true significance is rooted in God's purpose. By following the principles and becoming brave, you will feel your perspective shift as you learn how to embrace negative occurrences as faith-filled opportunities. You know, you and I can live fear-free when we learn how to overcome destructive thinking and develop a positive self-portrait. God wants you to think and live in a unique way. He actually needs you. There is a mission for you to fulfill. The question is, are you willing to think big, dream wildly, and live fear-free? I believe with all of my heart that you will and can become brave. I'm Jenna Quinn, and I'm the namesake behind Jenna's Law legislation, and there's a story behind why 
Um, there's legislation that bears my name. I am a survivor of child sexual abuse, but I also know that I'm not alone. It's estimated that one in four girls and one in six boys are sexually abused before the age of 18. This is a very prevalent crime, and the scriptures are very clear, and God is not silent um, about his vengeance for this crime and how outraged he is when his children are hurt. And so I was sexually abused uh, on more than one occasion um, by a very trusted family friend. Um, we met this family at the private Christian school uh, that my sisters and I attended. Um, so much of this happened within the faith environment. And after that first time, you know, when I was sexually abused, uh, I felt feelings I'd never felt before in, in my young life. Uh, feelings of intense shame and, and blame and fear and guilt. And I truly believed that I was forever changed and not for the better. I, I believed at my core that I was fundamentally flawed and believed those lies that shame whispered to my soul that, you know, I was a bad person. Maybe I did something wrong. Uh, maybe I was to blame and maybe I wasn't worth protecting. Maybe God had abandoned me. Um, and these are lies um, that shame continues to whisper to many survivors of child sexual abuse. And unfortunately, I changed in every way possible because I was threatened not to tell and I felt that I couldn't tell anyone because the shame and the guilt was unbearable. Um, sometimes children don't need to be threatened not to tell because usually the perpetrator is someone that they know and trust. Over 90% of the time a child is abused by someone that they know and trust and perpetrators use that uh, relationship, that known relationship with the child and their family as a deposit for their silence. I'm making it very difficult to tell. And so I changed. I, I was a very good student. I made good grades before the abuse, but afterwards I, uh, my grades fell. I became very depressed, suicidal, anxious, insomnia. I wasn't sleeping, and if I did sleep, I would have horrible night terrors. I had low self-worth, low self-esteem, was suicidal, and would even self-harm. Despair is very real and hopelessness is very real and shame and isolation often operate together and is a very dangerous place um, to be and shame, silence and shame are the enemy's weapon of choice. Um, so much that with this crime it's estimated that two-thirds of children don't tell at all and that means that there are many children that are suffering in silence. I finally at 16 years old was able to tell my sister what was going on. And from that point forward, um, I was able to receive help. Um, I almost went to a mental institution at 16 years old, but instead um, I received a revelation um, and a true realization of Christ's love for me. And I understood at that point that God was not the enemy, that God didn't abandon me. Although I felt rejected um, and hopeless and unlovable, um, those were farther from the truth. I understood that Christ died for me and he became despair and he became shame and he became guilt and then he soon defeated it by his resurrection and so I could understand and relate and really from that point flipped my frame of thought completely from the lies that I believed and understood now that you know what God was my only hope through all of this. And so now, um, with the legislation and Jenna's Law policy, uh, we're able to help uh, ministries, we're able to help um, groups that are responsible for children, help them learn how to um, prevent policies to minimize it, and especially how to recognize and report it, and how to support and believe survivors. And then on the response end, helping survivors understand and know and truly believe in their heart of hearts that at their core they are not fundamentally flawed. Um, rather, the revelation of what Jesus did for them is their true path to healing. And so we, we really want to help those of you who are struggling through this. If you are part of the two-thirds of people that have never told, uh, we, we want to help you and we want to help you understand that there is hope, there is healing, and His name is Jesus.
Man, it was, I couldn't help but laugh when I saw you <laughs> get tagged today uh, in those paintball wars. And that, it was you that shot me. That couldn't have felt good. <laughs> well, I was aiming at you and hit something that was supposed to hit. I yeah, that's, that's kind of how life is in general. We get tagged when we least expect it. I know yeah. there have been situations in my life where I, I honestly didn't see things coming. It don't always make sense. Does it doesn't. It? Mm -hmm. I think one of the key things in my life of walking in the spirit and walking in and out of is when life don't make sense. It doesn't make sense. Um, you know, Paul, I thought about this a while back, Tracy, uh, how he, he goes to heaven. Paul in the Bible? Yeah, 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 Paul in the Bible, not your uncle or whatever. Uh, thanks. He goes to heaven. I tell mm -hmm. people, not Honolulu, he's in heaven. He yeah. comes back. And uh, he's walked hand in hand with the Lord. And uh, he gets revelation, some things the Lord tells him when you get back to earth, uh, he said, I don't want to go back to earth. It's full of perplexity, Lord. Yeah. He says, well, when you get back, you can speak about that over there, but don't mention this. And you can talk about this, but don't mm -hmm. mention that. He comes back from heaven, standing right with the Lord and writes a second letter in Corinth and says to a spirit-filled people, I am perplexed. I believe it's in 2 Corinthians 4, yeah. verse seven or eight right there. He starts off, I'm perplexed, yeah. but I'm not in despair. I'm forsaken, but I'm not cast down. Mm -hmm. I mean, what a scripture from a man, a statement from a man that just got back from heaven. And the first thing he says is, I am very perplexed. I'm in a dilemma. But he said, I want you to know I refuse despair. I refuse it. You know, someone mentioned a while back, I think someone preaching said the definition of a dilemma that we all fall into in this life, this fallen Adamic mm -hmm. world is when there's no visible reason for what has just occurred in an individual's life. As long as you can figure out why it happened, uh, you're not in a dilemma. But right. the dilemma is when you cannot figure out. And I think the perplexing thing to me, out of all things in the church world even, is sometimes bad things happen to great people like great things happen to bad people. And you, you try to rationalize it and figure it out. And I came to the conclusion, you know, years ago, I think this is the answer to the mystery of all mysteries is bad things yeah. sometimes happen to great people. And it bugs us. It bothers us. And uh, I've, I've come to the conclusion that the Lord spoke to me that we always 100% reap what we sow. Mm -hmm. It don't matter your name, your father's accomplishments, whatever. You reap what you sow 100% of the time. But here's the dilemma. Sometimes we reap what other people sow around us. We always reap what yeah, we sow. Sure. But sometimes we reap what other people sow around us. And it brings us into, such as raising your children, great, but they go out and commit something they shouldn't. Right. And it brings the parent that raised them good. Well, you know, I, I think the prime example of that would be when, when you retrace humanity and you go back and see how God was the parent of humanity. Right so to speak, the father of Adam and Eve, and he placed them in a perfect environment, a mm -hmm. perfect utopia. Everything was scheduled to go right. God turns around, and it's not that it caught him by surprise, but yet, all of a sudden, this perfect utopia and perfect humanity is now sin infested. Right. And he has to recalibrate right. and go, okay, what now? What's the plan? Yeah. You know, how, how, do we, how do we step into this situation? It's not something that God sowed, but he himself is God reaped because two people made a choice and made a decision. Um, and same thing in our personal lives. Then how do we go when things happen that are unexpected, things that we haven't sown, so to speak? How do we, how do we figure out those seasons? What do we do? Well, I think that's a knowledge too, the, mm -hmm. the, the um, importance of knowing the knowledge and the wisdom of the word and letting God speak. But the, I think the problem that people have that a lot of baby Christians fall away the grounded people, even some of them fall away at times from this. But during a test, James says, brethren, my brethren, Christians, he didn't write into the world, he's talking right. to Christians. Count it all joy when you fall into divers, it says temptations, the King James Version should have used the word here. Right here the word was off, it should have mm -hmm. been used trials. God tempts no man with evil. So you're not to rejoice during a temptation, but you're to rejoice, count all joy when you fall mm -hmm. into divers test is the original word, and trials, but a right. test. And I thought about this, you've heard me preach this in the pulpit before, but um, the hard thing about a test that we Christians go through, it seems like God's silent. 
Yeah. It seems like at times what makes it a test is we need to hear something we're not hearing. And then I use the analogy when I thought about this. There's something that in school, K, kindergarten through 12th grade, on into college, on into your master's degree, mm -hmm. all the teachers passing out the test, the relationship between the student and the, and the teacher, K through 12 and college, mm -hmm. all has this one thing in common. The questions and the conversation between the teacher and the student is always before or after the test. Right. When the teacher passes out the test, what's the very next thing you hear the teacher say to the student taking the test? Shh, no talking, no talking. The questions and answers time is before and after the test. Mm -hmm. It seems like when God passes out a test, at times how you know you're in one as a believer, it seems like he's silent. Right. And how you build yourself and your knowledge mm -hmm. and study and everything, your determination and your discipline before the test yes. determines if you pass it or not. Right, sure. And I found that if you don't pass it and you flunk the test, guess what? Just like school, you got to take the grade over again. There's only one way for us to go to the next level. You got to pass the test. Mm -hmm. you gotta, you're going to take it, so you might as well determine in right. the spirit to pass it. Mm -hmm. And that's how we get elevated into the next spiritual level, spiritual level, spiritual levels going up mm -hmm. until one day we graduate into heaven. Right. Pass sure. the test. Yeah, I think about the life of Job and how more than anything, Job during the season when he lost his children, he lost his wealth, um, he, he lost everything in his life that mattered right. to him, is that his greatest craving, so to speak, was to hear from heaven. And in that moment, it seemed as if all of heaven was silent. And so Job began to conjecture in his own imagination and began to make false assumptions about who God was and why God wasn't responding. And, and yeah. so he began to look to his friends and his circle of influences and right. they began to, to speak into his life, but they weren't accurate things. And so I think when we're going through unexpected tests and trials, and it seems like we can't hear from heaven, that it's sometimes counterintuitive to expect humanity to come up with answers that we're not even hearing from heaven itself. And so we have to remember to constantly, consistently be in the presence of God. I know that many times when I'm in situations, I don't hear God speak to my heart. I don't hear him speak audibly, but it's the calming presence of knowing that he's in the situation, that he's in the storm. When when the disciples were in a boat, what does it say? That Jesus was asleep in the back of the ship. Yeah. And they questioned why he wasn't more involved, why he wasn't more engaged, why he didn't wake up and come to the front of the ship and, and speak something when they wanted him to speak. Right. And he said, where is your faith? Don't you know that even in the midst of the storm, though I wasn't giving you a verbal, audible instruction that my presence should have been enough to bring you comfort. And I think, again, that for those today who may be listening in on this conversation, that it's important to remember that you may not be hearing him audibly. You, he may not be giving you, per se, instructions today, but lean into that presence. Allow him to comfort you. Know that he's in the battle with you and that he's fighting for you. And I've learned also to speak to that storm. There's nothing right. wrong with that. Don't mark it as coincidence here yeah. and don't just speak to the storm. Mm -hmm. It says when Jesus, you mentioned in the sleeping in the boat, yes, he arose, disciples freaking out, flipping right, out. What did right. he say to him? Oh, you have a little faith. What's wrong with you? He walked straight to the bow of that yeah. ship. He looked up. And in the original translation here, it blew my mind when I studied this. He didn't just say King James Version, peace be still. Right. He directed his words straight to that storm. And he said, storm, mm -hmm. muzzle your mouth. The key to that yeah. word, the hub to the scripture there is 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 uh, is muzzle right muzzle storm he said muzzle your mouth mm -hmm. hush blowing and don't you blow again until i allow you to yes and it said the storm ceased well, yeah, when he asked them where was their faith, I mean, you have to look at the context of that scripture that he had just fed thousands, right. two fish, five loaves, should have been the ultimate, the apex of a faith experience, yet they get in one little tiny storm in the middle of the Sea of Galilee, and they're panic-filled. And how many times do we do the exact same thing? We, we yeah. have exited a season that was full of faith. We saw God perform the miraculous in our lives, and then all of a sudden, it's like someone pulls the plug on our faith, 
and we go from a tank full of faith and now to can't finding faith at all. And so we have to learn to be more consistent, constantly filling that um, tank full of faith and again, staying in His presence, reading His Word, leaning in, listening, and allowing Him to speak in those silent seasons. That's it. You know, yeah. Elijah nearly had a nervous breakdown. Yes. Here's what people forget. Underneath a juniper tree. Yeah. A juniper tree is a bush, so low to the ground you can't even walk Tiny. underneath it. You've got to crawl underneath yes. it, scoot under it. But you know what? He wound up refusing to spare. He was yes. very perplexed. A mean woman named mm. Jezebel was after him. Right. Now here's what people don't understand. He's one of the two witnesses of Revelation. Yeah. The debate is over Enoch and Moses. Yes. Guess what? The debate's not over Elijah. Mm -hmm. He is one of the two witnesses. I guess God is saying to Paul, Elijah, John mm -hmm. the Baptist, who was beheaded, 10 out of the original 12 disciples that were martyred. Yes. But you know what He says to them and us today? Yes. It's okay to be perplexed, yes. but it's not okay to fall into despair, right. to throw in the towel and quit. Perplexity in this world is normal. Despair, we can be judged if we fall into it. You know, you might be right now in a horrible situation physically, spiritually, emotionally, in your family. Think of those four things that puts us all in the, under the, something under the category in our lives. We've been there before. But if you'll just simply, in the midst of your perplexity, refuse despair, get hard-headed, get stubborn, and say, I will not throw in the towel and quit, but I'm going to continue to love God, serve God. I'm going to speak to my storm. And I'm going to be faithful until I see this thing pass. You're going to make it. Until next time, God bless you, man. We're glad you have watched us today. And we want you to watch this next program. Call your friends and relatives. Get them to watch this. We're going to be speaking life into your life. We'll see you next time. Bye-bye.